Thanks to Linode for supporting this SciShow video. To check them out, go to linode.com slash scishow. That link gives you a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. There is a case to be made that the sharpest object in the world can't cut anything. Which seems weird, right? If you've ever sliced an apple with a knife or sewn a badge with a needle, sharpness probably seems pretty straightforward. If a tool is sharp, it cuts. Right? But like most other things, and for really good reasons, scientists have tried to pin down a way of measuring sharpness. The weird thing is, they have not found a universal way to do it. There are a lot of ways to define sharpness depending on what thing you're trying to do. And those things could be important practices, from surgery to scientific research. And even if no one agrees on exactly how to measure it, our search for better tools has recently led to some of the sharpest objects we have ever created. Now, before we get to the sharpest object in the world, let's start with the first thing that probably comes to your mind when you hear sharp, a knife blade. Part of the reason it sticks out as such a vivid example is the distinct shape of a blade. Studying the exact details of that shape, its geometric properties, gives us a starting point for defining sharpness. The two sides of a blade's edge are usually straight and flat. And if we zoom into the very edge, there's kind of a wedge shape where the two sides meet. Intuitively, the sharpness of the wedge seems to come down to two main properties, how pointy it is and how narrow it is. So, scientists have created specific measures of pointiness and narrowness to try and define sharpness. Starting with the former, if we zoom in on the edge of a blade called the apex, the tip of the wedge doesn't shrink to an infinitely small point. Instead, it ends in a tiny curve. Think of that curve as forming part of a circle. The radius of that circle can tell us how tight the curve is, which ultimately defines how small the edge of the blade is. There's a word for this. It's called the edge radius, and it's the geometric way to describe the pointiness of a knife's edge. A smaller edge radius means a tighter curve, closer to an ideal, perfectly pointy shape. But edge radius isn't the whole story of sharpness, because even blades with the same radius can be thicker or thinner. For the edge radius to be helpful, we also have to pin down the narrowness part as well. That's defined by what we call the wedge angle, the angle between the two flat sides of the wedge. A smaller angle means a thinner wedge, which usually means a sharper blade. The upshot of all of this is that edge radius is only a helpful way of defining sharpness if the wedge angle is small. In practice, that means things that we call blades tend to be objects with wedge angles of about 20 degrees or less. If we do have a small wedge angle, then edge radius is a helpful start at determining sharpness. For instance, certain surgical scalpels have sapphire blades with an edge radius as thin as 25 nanometers, which is only a couple hundred atoms in width. And with a blade that sharp, the scars left behind by sapphire scalpels actually heal faster than steel scalpels, thanks to the incredibly precise, clean cuts it leaves in the skin. Plus, being made of hard sapphire and all the blades are also super durable. But even these ultra-sharp scalpels are not the cutting edge of cutting edges. That title belongs to blades made of obsidian, a kind of volcanic glass that can be crafted into an edge with an edge radius of just three nanometers across. That's just dozens of atoms thick, making it one of the sharpest objects we know of in terms of edge radius. Remarkably, we have been using these sharpest tools as a species since the Stone Age. And we still use obsidian blades today for certain kinds of surgery, since their ultra-sharpness means they can make cuts without needing to apply much pressure. This is useful when you're working on a very delicate, fluid-filled part of the body, like the eye, where we don't want to be poking into them too hard. In fact, obsidian blades are so sharp they can even cut individual cells in half. So in combination, edge radius and wedge angle describe the incredible cutting power of obsidian pretty well. You might assume, then, that defining sharpness is pretty cut and dry. Unfortunately, the geometric properties we've discussed so far have some shortcomings, like, say, describing the sharpness of needles and pins, which are also pretty sharp. Since they also come to a point at their tips, we could use a radius just as we did for blades. But unlike a blade, they don't have two flat sides forming that wedge. So wedge angle doesn't really make sense here. There are other angles that we can use, but they all come with their own issues. With hypodermic needles, for instance, there is the angle between the slanted bit at the very tip and the straight edge of the needle, which is called the bevel angle. And you might assume that a larger bevel angle means a sharper needle, but the weird thing 
thing is, that's not always true. One 2012 study in the Journal of Diabetes Science and Technology found that having multiple bevel angles on the same needle improved its ability to pierce skin, which is important for making them less painful and more effective. As for edge radius, it isn't always the most sensible way to think of sharpness, either. For instance, the smallest radius we've ever achieved on a man-made tool belongs to a tungsten nanoneedle created by scientists at the University of Alberta. It's a super thin structure that produces a tiny electrical current that jumps between the needle and a surface. By doing so, the needle tip can identify the positions of individual atoms on the surface and help us build up a picture of what the material looks like. And that tip is, wait for it, just one atom wide. You cannot get any tinier than that. It's because of this ridiculously small radius that the Guinness Book of World Records declared the tungsten nanoneedle the sharpest human-made object in the world. Which is cool and all, but as we said in the beginning, there is one small problem. That needle cannot cut or pierce anything. As you might imagine, an object that is just one atom thick is incredibly brittle. So that super sharpness, if we can call it that, doesn't improve the cutting power or poking power of the needle. It would snap as soon as we tried to apply any pressure to it. And that's not just a problem for tungsten nanoneedles. Even those obsidian surgical scalpels we mentioned earlier aren't used all the time because they're also brittle and risk breaking apart if a surgeon isn't careful. So when it comes to how easy something is to cut or pierce with, wedge angle and edge radius aren't the whole story behind sharpness. They only describe the geometry of an object rather than its functionality. We can actually turn this around and think about defining sharpness in terms of how easy something is to cut with, which leads to a mechanical definition. Specifically, we can define sharpness in terms of the amount of force we need to cut something. For instance, those obsidian scalpels we mentioned, they needed less pressure to make a cut into skin than traditional steel scalpels, and the same property crops up for other blades, too. One 2007 study by researchers at University College Dublin attempted to measure the sharpness of a blade cutting into soft materials by measuring how deep a given blade has to poke into the material before it initiates a cut. The researchers showed the distance reflects the amount of force you need to apply with a blade in order to cut. Basically, if you don't need much force and you only have to press a little, that's what defines a sharp blade. This makes a lot of sense based on how we think of sharp knives in the context of activities like cooking. Better still, the same researchers found that the familiar geometric properties of blades were correlated with this alternative definition of sharpness. Other studies have found similar results, connecting the wedge angle and edge radius definitions of sharpness to a lower amount of force needed to cut with a given blade. And that includes those Stone Age tools we mentioned earlier. A 2022 study led by an archaeologist at the University of Cambridge found that stone tools with a smaller edge radius needed less mechanical force to cut a PVC pipe. So for stone tools, at least, both the geometric and mechanical definitions of sharpness makes sense. But even if we use both definitions, there's still something missing from our picture of sharp tools. As it turns out, the mechanical force needed to cut a material depends on what that material is. We can't just focus on the tool itself. A 2018 study by Italian researchers at the University of Parma demonstrated this using a measure of sharpness that incorporated both the geometry of the tool and the material properties of the thing being cut. In the study, they used both a brittle polystyrene plastic and a soft silicone rubber. The sharpness metric behaved as expected in the polystyrene, with narrower tools needing less force to initiate a cut and form a crack in the material. But with the softer rubber, the shape of the blade didn't matter much. The force needed to make a cut was really similar for the blades that researchers defined as sharp and blunt for that material. That's because, unlike a brittle one, softer materials have to be squished into a lot more before a cut starts to appear. And that squishing, which researchers call large deformation, follow the broader shape of the tool rather than just the very, very edge. So sharpness depends on the thing that you're applying sharpness to. And I'm sorry about this, but it gets even weirder than that. The mechanical definitions we've just talked about broadly assume that only the forces and distances in the cutting process determine cutting sharpness. But that doesn't always hold true either. The way you cut also determines the apparent sharpness of a blade. For instance, one 1996 study by researchers at North Carolina State University found that increasing the speed of scissor blades cutting a plastic film reduced the amount of force needed to cut it. They suspected that this was because the film, like, crinkled up and became harder to cut at slower speeds, while at fast speeds the material was smooth and easier to cut for the same blade. Kind of like how cutting wrinkled up saran wrap is a whole lot harder than slicing through 
a smooth sheet. And a 2007 study by French researchers found that when they used carving knives to cut into a foam that had similar properties to meat, the angle at which the blade cut into the foam affected the amount of force needed to cut into it. All told, it turns out sharpness isn't just about an object's shape or how easily you can cut into something because the multiple definitions don't always overlap, and they interact with each other in complicated ways. So how do we define how sharp a tool is? How can we make a YouTube video about the sharpest object ever? Ultimately, it depends on the thing you're trying to cut and how you're planning on cutting it, as well as the shape of the tool. You have to consider everything from the speed, the angle, and the material of the object. In other words, to make a tool sharp, engineers have to stay pretty sharp, too. This SciShow video is supported by Linode, a cloud computing company from Akamai. Linode provides you and your company with solutions for cloud computing, storage needs, databases, analytics, and all that fun stuff. Pretty much any company could find a way to ramp up their workflow with Linode. They have a variety of applications, like Moodle for the classroom and Peppermint Ticket Management for the Fulfillment Center. Or if you spend all day in online meetings, Linode has applications for video conferencing, too. It doesn't matter if you're a small business or just hire your thousandth employee, Linode's options scale with your business, so you only pay for what you need, and you can add extra capabilities when they suit your company. To get started with Linode, you can check out the link in the description down below, or go to linode.com slash scishow for a $100 60-day credit on a new Linode account. And thank you for watching this SciShow video all the way to the end. As a reward, I'm just going to keep eating my apple.